So starting at uh, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or deceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with um, God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, In three days' time, the world is going to remember Christmas. Now, for most, it's a day of of feasting and family and gift-giving. But in reality, Christmas is a reminder of the greatest gift ever given. And so this December, we're considering God's generous gifts. And we started the series with the gift given. Uh, God the Creator gave the gift of life to humanity created in His image. Uh, God called His carefully designed world not just good, but very good. We saw that the world was without blemish. Everything was in perfect balance. We had harmony with nature. No bug bites, no snake bites, no disease or disaster. We had harmony in relationship. Adam and Eve, without sin, without corruption, fully intimate and completely unashamed. We also had harmony with God, the greatest relationship where we really need harmony, walking in the garden with our Creator. And the Bible says, this is eternal life that you may know the only true God. You see, God's gift of the good life is found in knowing Him. That's actually what the whole series of December is about. That's our theme line for the December series. And uh, Because only harmony with Him and His ways allows us to have harmony with His world and be satisfied in His gifts, okay? Now, we didn't realize just how good we had it in the garden. We're told not to eat the fruit of one tree. One restriction was too much for us. So we rejected God's gift. Last week, we considered that rejection. We reached out eating forbidden fruit, telling the Creator, His way is wrong, our way is better, we don't need Him. And that insulting rebellion cost us everything. Uh, We broke off our relationship with God. We're banished from His presence. All the harmony that we knew became disorder. Disasters with nature, dysfunction in relationship, and, and death physical death, but also spiritual death with God that leads to eternal death. So God could have turned His back on us ingrates, us rebels, but in loving grace, He offered His greatest gift, His very presence wrapped in flesh, the gift wrapped Jesus, His beloved Son. Jesus alone can restore our relationship with His Father, a restoration that overflows into fixing earthly relationships, friendships, marriages, parent, child, you name it. And that's the focus of our, of our message this morning, the gift wrapped. But next week, we're going to finish to usher in the new year with our final in the series, and that is the gift returns. See, when Jesus returns... He'll make everything new. The world will be new. He'll raise us in new bodies. So all who trust in Him will have a bigger, better, brighter Eden with God and His people that will never fall or fade. So it's that theme of gifts and the history of God's plan to save and redeem the world that is our focus this December. And uh, the key point in this plan began at Christmas in the key person of Jesus. So with that in mind, I will turn, we'll turn, I'll lead us in prayer, and we'll consider the gift wrapped. <clears throat> our God, our Father, our gracious gift giver, 
Please, Lord, forgive us for our many sins, for all our plans of self-promotion, pursuing our own kingdoms, not yours, for you are the true king. Like Adam and Eve, Lord, we are easily captivated by the objects our eyes desire. We, we fail so often. And when we do, we either justify ourselves or we run and hide in shame and instead of running to you to confess our sin and find forgiveness and joy and justification in Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for entering our world to rescue us from ourselves. Thank you that your mercy is more than a match for all our sins. Holy Spirit, fill us with everlasting wonder of these truths. Open our eyes to the glory of Christ. Lord, your kingdom come in this morning. Show us your plan in Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, as we discuss gifts, uh, there's a phrase, the gift that keeps on giving. You may have heard that phrase, and it's used sometimes negatively and sometimes positively. Now, for a negative example, I need to tell you something. Americans and fruitcake do not have a good relationship, okay? Uh, many a meme point this out. Uh, even the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz doesn't like fruitcake. And of all the Star Wars episodes, Jar Jar Binks is hands down the lamest character in all of Star Wars, and fruitcake is the Jar Jar Binks of Christmas. Now until, well, I could go on and on because I just hit fruitcake memes, and there are thousands of these, but I think one sums them up best. It says there is only one fruitcake in the entire world, and people just keep sending it to each other. It is the gift. <laughs> that keeps on giving. Now, until I moved here, I, I actually thought the whole world despised fruitcakes. Uh, until that, as I committed my first faux pas, my first cultural foot in mouth in Australia. Uh, we were playing the game of taboo, like a, a church games night. And uh, you know, that's the game with a countdown buzzer. And you have to give clues. And I couldn't say fruit or cake. And I'm trying everything, uh, various clues, like, you know, he's cuckoo, nutty as a, and nothing was sinking in. So finally, the, the buzzer's, you know, beep, beep, beep. It's getting feeling hot. It's about to explode. So I just shout, right? It's the dessert everybody hates. Nobody eats it. It's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> And the buzzer goes off, right? And everybody's looking confused. I'm like, it's fruitcake. And silence, <laughs> right? And boom, the buzzer didn't go off. Boom, the bomb of my cultural faux pas went off. And someone who's now an elder at Grace Bible Church and thankfully still a friend said, I like fruitcake. <laughs> and then everybody said, I like fruitcake too. And I said, oh no. Oh no. And I, when I realized I wasn't in a weird sort of alternate universe, and this is reality, I realized the cultural divide. Now the point is not different tastes about fruitcake. The point is that no matter your culture, you've all experienced that negative sense of a gift that keeps on giving. When you get a gift, you think is a dud, right? So you pass it on hoping that your trash is someone's treasure, and oh, I hope Koisi likes fruitcake, right? That's, that's what we hope, that somebody would like that, right? That's the negative sense of the gift that keeps on giving, but there's a really positive sense, too. Gifts that give enjoyment over and over and over again, like maybe getting a camera, and you can take photo after photo after photo and share them, share it with the person who gave you the camera. It keeps giving and giving. Now, a few days on from Christmas, I want to point out the most, in the most positive sense, the original Christmas gift to humanity. Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. See, what Jesus accomplished and the promises he made, they echo down to every generation, including ours today. Jesus himself said, come to me all 
who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, rest for your soul. And the Bible promises to every generation, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. See, the gift of Jesus and the gift of salvation He offers keep on giving today. Now, in our series on the good life, today's idea in a sentence is this. It should be in your bulletin with its lovely, colorful front. Um, The sentence is, Jesus is the key to the good life. See, he himself said this, I have come, why? I have come so that you may have life and have it in abundance. That's why Jesus came, to give us life abundant, life eternal. And this morning I want us to consider why Jesus is the key to the genuinely good life that everyone seeks. And we're going to focus mainly on one famous verse, also in the Gospel of John, not John 10, but John 3.16. We'll also look at Philippians 2, which Josh read, but John 3.16, a lot of you might have it memorized. It says, for God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now, we're going to investigate this verse in, in two points. First, abundant life is wrapped up in Jesus, and then knowing Jesus unwraps the gift of eternal life. So let's get into our first point. Abundant life is wrapped up in Jesus. God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son. See, Jesus is indeed given as a gift from the Father. Now, remember, a gift is never earned. We call that a wage. A gift is given freely unearned. And we certainly did not earn the gift of Jesus. Remember last week, the gift rejected, us in the garden thumbing our nose at God's perfect provision, shaking our puny fists in rebellion to Him? That rebellion was not a one-off, that rebellion that brought the curse and corruption. It's a, that rebellion is a theme that continues throughout biblical history. After the grace of God's rainbow, promising that He would never flood the whole earth again, what's the first thing that Noah does after he plants a vineyard? He gets drunk, smashed, drunk as a skunk. Now, when the population picks up a bit, in defiance of God's call to humanity to multiply and fill the earth, right, with His image, enculturating it in God's name, we defied God, staying put, building a monument to ourselves at the Tower of Babel, again trying to create our own way to heaven. Then later, Israel's in slavery in Egypt, and they're set free. And how do they respond to God rescuing them from slavery in Egypt? Boo-hoo! We had tastier food while we were slaves. Shame on you, God, for giving us freedom. And on and on it goes. So the start of John 3.16 is a stunner of a verse. God loves the world? Yeah, He loves us. In our shame and guilt, we deserve punishment, judgment. God in His love shows us grace, undeserved favor in place of deserved disfavor. And a gift displays the heart of the giver. So a generous gift displays a generous heart. God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son. Wow, like that's pretty special. What makes Jesus so special, so unique? Well, it's about who Jesus is, the eternal God who took on flesh, God with us, Emmanuel. 
See, the Bible verses that Josh read earlier from the book of Philippians in the Bible help us here. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to advance my God loved the world and he, how much He gave us His Son. Here's Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7. Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be exploited. So here you have Jesus, the Son, God the Son, and you have God the Father in heaven in perfect fellowship. But Jesus said, I'm not going to cling to that and just use that to my advantage. I'm not going to use my divinity just for me. Instead, He emptied Himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of us. Wow! At Christmas, God the Son gave up glory to be born in a humble manger, to be humbled in the form of, of a man. See, for God the Father, Christmas is not about spending. It's about sending His Son, giving Him to us. And for God the Son, Christmas is not about shopping. It's about dropping. Not just dropping down from heaven. No more than that, dropping His glory, dropping His privileges, letting go of His position, humbling Himself, the Creator entering creation. So, so for those of us already Christians, the, the doctrine of the Incarnation, God taking on flesh, has enormous practical implications. It doesn't just tell us that God's not far away. It doesn't just tell us that God loves us. It shows us and models the way life is meant to be. Jesus modeled life done right, the abundant life. The sinless and fulfilled all righteousness. You see, the Philippian church to which this is right, they were struggling with pride and infighting. And, and the book mentions this a few times. A couple of women are told, you guys need to agree in Christ. Get along in Jesus. And and that, this happens a few times, and the verses immediately before these, verses 3 to 5, show us the, the problem and how Jesus is the solution. His incarnation is the solution. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out, not for his own interest, but for the interest of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, emptied Himself. See, the one who deserved it all gave it all up. The one who was full emptied Himself for us. See, we need that humble incarnational attitude, the mind of Christ, to have peace and, and to stop fighting. See, the, there's a fascinating wordplay going on. We, we see a contrast. Verse 3 says that humility is the antidote for conceit. Now, that Greek word for conceit, it means empty glory, vain glory. It, it means to be glory-starved, glory-starving. See, Jesus was full and He emptied Himself. We are empty and we're trying to fill ourselves with some kind of glory, approval of others. We're starved for validation. And this glory-starved attitude leads to fighting one another for approval, for validation that we think will make us secure, happy, important. Harriet Rubin is a non-Christian who wrote an article called Success and Excess in a business magazine called Fast Company. And in this column, she tells story after story after story of people reaching for the top, using all of their means to achieve money, power, and glory, but then self-destructing. See, she actually recognizes that our vain glory does not satisfy. It leads to destruction. Destruction of your relationships, your marriage, your friendships, 
your jobs. Listen, only when we receive the approval and esteem of the one we esteem will our souls be at rest, will we be satisfied. So like Jesus, we must seek the approval of God the Father, not sinners, not the world. See, our soul will remain restless and empty until it's filled with the smile of God, found in His Son, who always did the will of the Father, who has the Father's full approval, and when we're in Christ, we get the smile of the Father in the Son. See, Jesus' humility is the antidote to conceit. See, if, if what makes you and us bitter and combative is this inner emptiness of the soul that we're trying to fill with worldly approval, then the opposite, humility, is an inner fullness, secure in our standing with God's approval, that we're right with Him, looking to the interest of others like Jesus. See, humility is actually determined by what we habitually look at, and that's why verse 4 says, everyone should look out, not to his own interests, but for the interests of others. Where, where do you tend to look? Where do we all tend to look first? At ourselves, our interests, right? I and mean, that's just, that's our fallen nature. I really like a famous way C.S. Lewis put the way he described humility, because I think we get it wrong and, and often. He says, very well, Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking, I'm lame. It's, it's just not thinking about me. It's thinking about others. See, if you're empty, you're constantly looking to yourself. What about me? But if you've been filled with Christ in the approval of the Father, you have the capacity to look at others like Jesus in His mindset. See, you, you know what it's like when your stomach's empty. Say you're working in the city and there's all the food trucks and cafe and you've got to get there, but oh, there's Starbucks and there's this. And when you're empty, you want to fill your gut. But when you're full, you just go straight to your destination because you're already full, right? So how are we filled with God's Spirit? How do we have the mindset of Christ? How does Jesus save us? What is the depth? of His humility. This brings us to the second half of, of John 3.16, that eternal life is wrapped up in Jesus, but then knowing Jesus unwraps eternal life. For God loved the world in this way, not just that He gave His one and only Son, why? So that everyone who believes in Jesus will not perish but have eternal life. We won't perish in eternal judgment if we believe in, in Jesus. Well, believe what exactly? Well, one more verse from Philippians 2, verse 8, unpacks this a bit further about, about the depths of Jesus' humility, his, his emptying, what we're to believe in by faith, what we cling to. This unpacks the second half of John 3.16. Philippians 2.8 says, Jesus emptied Himself. He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus' birth led to His uniquely sinless life, and this meant His uniquely sacrificial death could be our salvation. See, here's the logic of the incarnation and the crucifixion. God is spirit, so He can't die. Okay, we got that. Now, to be saved, man needs a substitute to die in the place of men. 
So God became a man to die in the place of men. This is what the Bible says, since we have flesh and blood, Jesus also shared in these. He had to be made like people to make atonement for the sins of people. We need a righteous substitute, and Jesus perished so that we might not perish if we trust in Him. See, that is humility. That is grace. We turned away from God, so we deserve God to turn away from us. And what happened? God turned away from His Son, who said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? To to save us, that we might not perish. This glorious truth, this is what must fill us. This is what we are to believe, to trust in, to trust that Christ alone takes our wretchedness and gives us His righteousness, and that Jesus rose from death so that we too can rise with Him again and be with Him forever. See, some like fruitcake, and some don't. Some eat it like treasure, and others just pass it on like trash. This Christmas, please do not pass along Jesus, the greatest gift of all, the Son of God wrapped in flesh, to die in our place, to save us from judgment. He's the key to the good life and eternal life. Only He can fill you. Only He can fulfill you. Only Jesus can save you. Don't don't pass him on like fruitcake. There's more at stake. See, about being filled and fulfilled. uh, A woman by the well understood this 2,000 years ago. uh, When Jesus, after that first Christmas, grew up and his sandals lifted the earth's dust and He was tired, and so he stopped by a well for a drink. And as he sat there, he spoke to a woman and told her about a gift. Just like us, this woman was looking for fulfillment. She sought it in the arms of a man. And when she didn't find it in one, she sought it in the arms of another and another and another and the bed of another, and another, and another, scandalous. For her, it was to find fulfillment in, a, in a, the wrong man. And she couldn't. It, it was as if her thirst for the abundant life could not be quenched. So Jesus told her, you've been searching in the wrong places, and that if you knew the gift of God her thirst would be satisfied, quenched. You know, her story really isn't different than ours. We're all looking for the perfect gift, uh, the gift of gifts that's going to fulfill and satisfy. Some of it's going to be trying to find the best house. We just built a house, and boy, that's a tough thing not to make an idol, building a house. It might be seeking the best job. It might be seeking the best marriage. You know, if I just had this spouse or if I had this house, well, then I'd live happily ever after. No, no, you wouldn't. Your search wouldn't be over. My search wouldn't be over. See, the woman by the well longing for Messiah, the promised one to come, to to make things right, to make things whole, to restore us to God, the one who would save and satisfy. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, and then he said, if you knew the gift of God who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water, eternal, perpetual satisfaction. She deserved judgment and Jesus offered her life, abundant life, life eternal, 
And so, in repentant faith, she asked Jesus, and she was filled, and she was forgiven. Abundant life now and abundant life forever. She didn't pass by the gift that Jesus offered, like stale fruitcake. Is fruitcake ever not stale? I don't know. (laughs) She didn't pass him by like fruitcake. She actually passed along the news of Jesus. She went into town and she told everyone that she found Messiah. And many believed, not just based on what she said, but when they too met Jesus. I've been praying this week for two outcomes for everyone in this congregation. The first outcome is for those who are already Christians, that you would so delight in God's glorious grace, in the gift of Jesus, that you just want to share Him, tell others about Him, and that in His fullness filling you, you would have the mindset of Christ looking to one another to bless, to meet needs of others. So if you're a family that exchanges gifts on Christmas, I'd like to ask you to do something. Take a moment after you open a gift and look at the face of the person who gave you the gift, whether it's a a mom or dad or grandparents, an auntie or uncle, family, friends, whoever. See the joy in their face in gifting you, whatever that is, even if it's fruitcake and you like that, right? And as you see their joy, please remember the smile of God that is found only in Jesus Christ, who always did the will of His Father so that we could be adopted by grace and enter His family forever. Because He wants to bring you eternal joy, life abundant. The second thing I've been praying for, if you're not yet a Christian, is that you would unwrap the gift of Jesus this Christmas. The greatest gift. That that you would repent of your sin and trust in Christ today and be restored to relationship with God, saved from the condemnation we all deserve and enjoying His abundant life forever. I'd like you to just imagine three days from now, presumably if you have a tree and gifts underneath it, and and you you rush out on the morning to see the gifts present and... um, all the decorations and ribbons and lights, and uh, then you walk away. You just leave all the gifts untouched, leaving everything unopened. All that anticipation, all that excitement, all that preparation, and you're just going to walk away. For centuries, for millennia, the Messiah's coming was anticipated, and He has come. And he's grown, and he's the king, and he's died, and he's risen again. God wrapped him in flesh. Will you unwrap the gift of salvation in Jesus? Don't just look at the tree and walk away. Be awestruck at the grace of God to you. And come back next week as well to to finish the finale. The gift returns You see, some some gifts are a royal pain. Some gift returns, right? They can be a royal pain. You know, the lines, you have to take the item back, uh, finding the receipt, the questions, why are you returning that, da-da-da-da-da. But not all all returned gifts are dodgy. Uh, I have wireless earbuds, and they had this irritating cylindrical case. And every time I'd set it down, it would roll off, hit the floor, pop open, and they'd spring out, and I'd have to pick up the pieces. Well, the case eventually broke, still under warranty, so I went in, 
And I said, oh, look, the, the case is broken. And they said, oh, we don't sell the cases only. We actually, that's two generations old. We don't stock that anymore. All we have is this one. Oh, it's not a round case. It doesn't, doesn't roll open. Um, oh, gee, the earbuds are magnetized. Both of them work on the phone, not just one ear, and they're waterproof. Would you like that as a replacement? I'm like, woohoo, right? That was like, whoa, not all gift returns are dodgy. Sometimes you get better. When Jesus comes again, the anticipation is awesome because it's bigger and better and a brighter Eden that we're going to see that will never be tainted. See, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human heart has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Let's anticipate that day together. Come to Christ now and unwrap the gift. Worship Him until He returns. And come back next week as we hear the end of the Bible and what that glory will be like. Will you pray with me? Our great God, you love the world in this way. You gave your one and only Son. And our great Christ, you love the church and gave yourself up for her. God, in you we find love and grace and forgiveness. You are holy. You are a consuming fire. Fires that must be attended to. Right, right now in Australia, there are hundreds of fires burning. And when the fireman knocks on the door and beckons you to evacuate, we listen. Lord, may we listen today. You are a holy God, a consuming fire, a just judge. And we must escape judgment to not perish, to have life. In your grace and love, you offer Christ. May we turn to you through Christ alone. Humble us, Lord to see that we are beggars and sinners who can be filled with the fullness of Christ. What does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? And Jesus lost his life so that we could gain our souls. To you be glory and honor and praise this Christmas as we sing, prepare him room. In Jesus' name, amen.